1969, and once again in 1980, we visited the Soviet Union, and we traveled very widely, seeing what tourists see, from Riga to Tashkent, but we were also very much interested in Jewish life in the Soviet Union, Soviet culture, Jew Jewish culture, Jewish well-being. So we made it our business to visit synagogues also from Minsk to Almata. And the experiences then were profound for us, and in some cases, truly unforgettable. Uh, let me start with just a moment, uh, uh, a memory that comes to mind, coming to a synagogue in Alma'ata, and this white-bearded patriarch from across the synagogue they told him that I was from Israel. They told me that he was a convert to Judaism. And this is 1969. And he ran across the synagogue and grabbed me and held me and wouldn't let me go. I had to force myself free. Uh, we were invited to people's homes and quite surprised when we came in to meet a room full of Hebrew speakers, wonderful Hebrew speakers, all of whom spoke of coming to Israel. There were even among them, strangely, in 1969, some who were religious. These Jews were the first ones to leave when the Soviet Union collapsed. And from 1990 to 19, uh, sorry, 1990 to 1993, it was this cohort of Jews who came to Israel. These Jews were profoundly sometimes naively, uh, yearning to come to Israel. My wife at that time wore a big Magen David, Star of David necklace, which caused great staring in the streets. But at the same time, many Jews would see it, come over to us and whisper, let's meet in my apartment, or more likely, let's meet distantly in the middle of a park. Um, when the Soviet Union collapsed, as I said, the initial wave was of these very committed Jews. But later, starting roughly about 1995, the people who were coming were not coming out of profound emotional ties to the home, to Zion, etc. But their decisions to come to Israel were a lot more rational, calculated. More questions of what are called cost-benefit analyses. What opportunities for work were there? How will I get an apartment, which are very expensive in Israel, children's education, cultural opportunities, and the like? And then there is another pivotal moment, and that is about the year 2000, when the changes were even more radical in terms of the demography and character of those who were coming to Israel. The percentage of those who were not Jewish, at least according to what the Orthodox rabbinate says, were greater than those 
who were Jewish according to Halakha uh, Jewish law. Last year, in 2018, I just looked up the number the other day, there were 32,000 Olim immigrants from the former Soviet Union, 18,000 were not halachically Jewish. And what they answered to the question, <coughs> where you fit into which box, they said, I don't have any religion. But Israel accepted them nevertheless under the law of return. Now, I will be speaking for a moment about the law of return, but let me say right away what it is. Israel accepts as full citizens anyone who returns to Israel, returns to Israel under the law of return. If you have a spouse who is Jewish, you are not. Parents who are Jewish, you are not. <laughs> children who are Jewish, grandparents who are Jewish, even if they do not come themselves, even if they are already dead, having a Jewish grandparent is enough for Israel not to accept you as a Jew. That's a different question. But to recognize you as someone who is returning to Israel under the law of return. Uh, why would such a generous latitudinarian law be passed? Because if the law were that only halachic Jews could come, there would be a very small pool of people from which Aliyah, immigration, could take place. Israel is interested for demographic reasons in having more people come who are vaguely Jewish in some way, because Israel, as you all probably know, has about 20% of the population that are Palestinians, either Muslims, about 90%, or Christian Arabs, who are about 10%. Now, Israeli Arabs, to one degree or other, have a certain antagonism to the idea of a Jewish state. Um, interestingly, when asked and polled, the vast majority say we want to live in Israel, we wouldn't want to live anywhere else. One of the famous quotes is, we live in a villa in the jungle, so we want to stay here. Uh, but nevertheless, the idea of a state based on Jewish identity, obviously in some way, excludes them, even if they're called equal citizens in all, in all respects. Uh, nevertheless, Israel has an interest in keeping the 80-20 majority between Jews and Arabs. There are a couple in the middle who are neither. But it's in important for Israel as a democratic and a Jewish state to keep this uh, division of 80-20 more or less. So both sides here of the equation are thinking instrumentally, I'm talking about today. The Jews, or I will call them non-Jewish Jews, the non-Jewish Jews, non-Halachic Jews, are coming for very specific reasons. They've heard from their relatives who've come, friends who've come, 
that life is good despite the fact that this is a troubled small country tucked away in a corner of the Middle East. Uh, Israel, on the other hand, has its own instrumental reasons for wanting them to come, and that is to keep the demographic, demographic uh, division the way it is. All told, since about 1990, a million Soviet, former Soviet Union, Russians plus others, have returned, come back, immigrated, choose your own term, uh, to Israel. About 60% of those who left the former Soviet Union came to Israel. 40% went either to the United States or Canada, and a rather large group, oddly, went to Germany. Well, Germany, with its sense of guilt, gave them uh, good conditions to come to Germany and re-give birth again to the Jewish community that had been wiped out. Uh, a a hundred thousand of those who emigrated returned very quickly either to their former countries in uh, Eastern Europe, uh, some went to the West, um, etc. Uh, about 80% of these million olim um, were from the eastern part of the former Soviet Union. Only 20% came from, well, say, Central Asia. Okay. Most recently, in the past 10, 15 years, certainly, the attitude of these former Soviet, ex-Soviet Olim is rather equivocal, apathetic towards Judaism. They do not see themselves as being there as enthusiastic <laughs> Jews. And this, of course, derives, among other things, from three generations of Soviet repression in which Jewishness was fundamentally wiped out. The Jewish holidays were verboten, as they say in German. Um, uh, Jewish education, of course, didn't exist, etc. Among those who came, only 7% spoke of themselves as either religious or tending toward traditionalism. The rest spoke of themselves as secular or no religion. The Soviet Union created this world because it repressed all signs of Jewishness, including the speaking of Yiddish, which they called jargon, which was non-complementary term for a kind of underground, worthless uh, folk religion that really had no literary uh, importance and certainly didn't deserve the word a language. Only in one place was Yiddish spoken, forced to be spoken, and that is Stalin erected a small Potemkin set, let's call it, in Birobajan, way off in the east, in which they always show the picture of the train station where it said Biro Bajan, not in Hebrew, not in Hebrew spelling, but in Yiddish spelling. Many of these Russians who came, given their Soviet background, had, uh, you could say, even stereotypes 
typical views of Jews and Judaism. Stereotypical, of course, I mean not positive. They look down, and this continues to today, on Jewish culture in Israel as somehow <coughs> provincial. <coughs> the Levantine, not great Russian, European, universal uh, literature. Where is your Tolstoy? Where is your Chekhov? Etc. Etc. Now, this is a very strange feeling today to someone who lives very close to Tel Aviv, because Tel Aviv, per capita, <coughs> has more theaters, movies, cafes, restaurants, etc., than virtually any other city of its size in the world. Right? 350,000, that is what? 15% of Kiev, more or less. And it calls itself, truthfully and justly, the city that never stops. Now, considering the fact that one in every six Israelis, roughly, is either an immigrant from the ex-Soviet Union or the child of an immigrant from the Soviet Union, ex-Soviet Union, their attitude towards Israel's politics, towards Israel's religious character, more or less, is of critical importance. These attitudes, let me say right at the start, are extremely complex, manifold and multifaceted, and sometimes I will just raise my hands and say, I don't understand. I can't follow how this fits with that, but it is nevertheless the truth. Um, Many of the Jews who come, who I just described as non-Jewish Jews, not halachic Jews, slowly permeate into Israeli Jewish societies through a process that I have called sociological conversion. It is not religious conversion. They do not go under, or undergo any ceremony, but they nevertheless become a part of Jewish-Israeli society. They study, the children study in Hebrew Jewish schools. They serve in the army, which is an extremely powerful socializer. Uh, and when their children come home on Chanukah, the winter holiday, with a little Chanukiah, a little menorah that they made in kindergarten, which all of them do out of bottle caps and all kinds of creative, uh, they want their parents to light a candle the way they did in school. And hence, they are drawn into the uh, world of Jewish Israel. Now we get to what is perhaps the most troublesome, problematic question, and that is that roughly one-third of the million Jews who came to Israel are non Halachic Jews, according to the Israeli rabbinate. A third, about 300,000 something. Uh, normally, those who are non halachic, non Jewish Jews, find it more difficult to integrate into Israel society than others. Not because the secular world in which they travel rejects them, no, 
much more because their original commitment to things Jewish was weak right from the start. <clears throat> but this is only the general rule. And here the complications begin. Many who are not halakhically Jewish, nevertheless, are drawn in politics to the nationalist right wing. You explain that to me. The nationalist, hard right, anti-Arab, um, xenophobic sometimes as well. They are, their Jewishness is not terribly important to them for some reason. Either they're non-Jewish Jews or they are consider themselves perhaps cultural Jews without a religion, etc. But nevertheless, they move to the right. Sometimes to what today is called the illiberal right, the right of Viktor Orban, for example. Now, it is this mix of lukewarm uh, association, connection with um, Israel as a Jewish state, and on the other hand, their tendency toward the nationalist parties which clearly requires an answer or an explanation. And as I said a moment ago, I don't know the real reasons entirely. I can guess, but there are no numbers that I can find. So again, this is my guess. Before I start guessing and prophesizing, I would like to return to something that social scientists have done for the last 20 and 30 years. Attempting to understand different reactions to immigration from a home country to a new country, they have divided these new immigrants into four different categories, different reactions to immigration. The first one is assimilation. That is, they join the country that they've come to and basically reject the country that they've come from. The Jews, perhaps half the Jewish population today, who come from either the Maghreb or the Middle East, Syria, Iraq, all the way to Iran or Yemen, basically reject or push aside their background or loyalty to these states. They do not yearn to return to Yemen or to Syria. They may keep up some traditions that they learned at home, but their patriotism and their identity are to Israel. Uh, a personal story, my father left Germany at the very last moment in 1938. He came to the United States, hence my English. When he stepped off the plane, he made a decision. Well, actually, it was a boat. He stepped off the boat, he made a decision. No more German, no more Germany. I am forgetting about it. And from that day on, I, growing up for 26 years in his home, never heard him speak German. He went right away to English with a dictionary, and he mastered the language. That is a case of pure assimilation, and it is similar to the non-Ashkenazi, Sephardi Jews in Israel who 
only with difficulty, if you push them, will they speak Arabic. And the Arabic that they speak is Judeo-Arabic, which is closer, has connections to, uh, uh, to Hebrew. That is assimilation. The opposite is what they call segregation or separation. These immigrant, um, immigrants reject the country that they're coming to, its values and its culture. They have physically made the move, but they reject the values of this new country. Think of many Muslims in France. They have moved to France. Some of them have undergone some form of uh, francophonization, if one can say that. Uh, but many, perhaps most, retain their uh, Muslim, Arabic, Iranian, no, not Iranian, but a Muslim, Arabic uh, uh, culture and reject the values of the West. The third category is integration. And that is the one that most Anglo-American, Australian, Canadian, New Zealanders undergo when they come to Israel. They're unwilling to give up their American Anglo-Saxon tradition, as they call it, but they want to be deeply involved with Israel nevertheless. This has happened, too, with some of the immigrants from uh, France. Uh, it has not happened, or over the time has disappeared, from people who came from Romania or Hungary or Czechoslovakia and the rest. The only holdout, and this is really fascinating, the only holdout were the German Jews who came in the 1930s, who loved Deutsche Kultur, German high culture, and they held on strongly. The uh, Israeli novelist Amos Oz tells of a man in his neighborhood who would give the children a candy if they agreed that Goethe was greater than Shakespeare. <laughs> this form of integration involves a dual commitment. One does not cancel the other. Many, many of the post-Soviet immigrants fall into this category although they have moved toward that category gradually from the separation segregation model that I mentioned just a moment ago. Slowly, the longer they are there, the more they are educated, the more they serve in the army, and very importantly, the more they succeed economically, move toward integration, that is, preserving their Russian uh, culture, and nevertheless, uh, nevertheless, uh, becoming more and more Israelis. One of the easiest ways these days to know where you are, because of the great digital revolution, cable television, you can watch the Russian channels, you can watch the Hebrew-Israeli channel, you can watch CNN, etc. What does the former Soviet Union person do? Does he watch Israeli, Hebrew, Russian, etc.? I can tell you that my wife and I 
jump back and forth between the English-speaking channels and uh, the Hebrew-speaking channels. As I said, Romanians, Hungarians lose. There used to be a Hungarian newspaper, Ukulet. There was a Romanian newspaper, the name of which I do not remember. But Russian is available all over. The, there is a newspaper called Vesti, which is a large circulation Russian newspaper with, recalling a previous conversation, with very right-wing uh, nationalist views. And there is even a Russian channel that is run by Israeli TV. You can watch Russian channel with the, the person, the, the company, the organization that runs it is Israel. Uh, very interestingly, if you call, uh, say, your health organization, and you want to speak about some issue or problem, the beginning will start, I will say it in English, for Hebrew, press one. For English, press two. For Russian, press three. For Arabic, press four. When you go to the ATM, the cash machines that you take money out of in the bank, it will also say, choose your language and you press uh, the right one for you. So we've spoken about assimilation, segregation, integration, the last one, which is the most problematic, is people who fall between all the chairs, who reject the culture of their past, who do not accept the culture in which they live. These are called marginals, or marginality is the term that's usually used, and the association between them and criminal behavior is quite high. Research that was done, say, 10 years ago, showed that the former Soviet Union immigrants were slowly, gradually, year by year, no jumps, were moving from a separation model towards an integration model. Um, uh, most Jews in Israel, 90 some odd percent, are immigrants from 70 different countries, according to the Jewish Agency. 70 different countries. Those who came before the founding of the state, the assimilation model was almost complete. It was part of the ideology of coming there. A new Hebrew man, a new Jew, a new country, etc., etc. Those who came after the Holocaust, their commitment or enthusiastic as, enthusiasm as Jews tended to decline until today the former Soviet Union who say that they have no religion at all. There is another serious problem that again is slowly changing. Many, many Russians especially I mentioned this parenthetically a moment ago, think of Russian culture as high culture. And think of Israeli culture as provincial low culture. It has taken a long time for these ideas to change. And they are still quite prevalent. Even though, it is interesting, 
that since 2000, yes, eight Israelis have won the Nobel Prize, while the Russians have only won six. So clearly the idea of high culture and low culture is at least questionable. Israeli literature. Uh, I imagine that most of you have heard the name of Amos Oz or David Grossman or many others who have won virtually every, pri every literary prize that there is. That too puts Israel on a map culturally. And do I need to tell you that Israel is the startup nation? More high-tech startups per capita than anywhere except for Silicon Valley. Now, it's harder and harder to put Israel in the category of a non-cultured state. Uh, and there is another uh, reason that is, uh, well, sort of comic. So if it's comic, I'll start with a joke, which was very popular in the 1990s. What do you call a Russian Ole who comes off the plane without a violin under his arm? A pianist. The Russians brought with them a great deal of their culture and as a result have changed Israeli culture. There are, I think, three or four new orchestras that were formed by these Soviet immigrants. Any number of chamber music groups, ballet um, uh, theaters, maybe some of you have heard the name of Penopanov, one of the great Russian choreographers, and etc., etc. Uh, another reason that they are slowly going through this process of integration is simply because they are getting political power. At first, when they came, surveys said that one of the problems that the Russian immigrants had was they felt politically powerless. This is no longer the case. I just will mention a few. The Speaker of the Parliament of the Knesset is an ex-Russian immigrant. The defense minister and foreign minister, Viktor Lieberman, were, were also uh, Soviet uh, immigrants. Natan Sharansky, whom many of you may know the name, was, the, was in with parliament and then the head of the Jewish agency. There is an Elkin. I won't go in through the names that you probably don't recognize, but there are many, and they are becoming felt as a political force. After saying all this, I have to go back to the other side. Nevertheless, ex-Soviet Jews are significantly less likely to define themselves as Zionists than veteran long-time Israelis. In 1990, 93, 94, 50%, 52% of those who came defined themselves as mostly Jewish. 37% said they were Russian. If we go forward just a few years, the numbers turn around. Jewish identity, only 33%. Russian identity, 63%. In any case, in the 2000s, when asked Russian, Jewish, Israeli, Israeli was the last. 
of the three that they were in. But this was roughly 10, 12 years ago. There has not been research that I know of since then. And what has happened is that when Russians begin to speak Hebrew fluently, don't find themselves behind a barrier of language, when they make it professionally, and many of them do because they are educated people by and large, when they serve in the army, of course, when they begin to move into areas that are not Russian enclaves, they begin to feel more and more, if not Zionist, but acting as if they were Zionists by joining right-wing Zionist parties. Uh, it is true that for many of these Russian immigrants, entering Jewish-Israeli society is instrumental. They know that the only way that they are going to make it in the country is to master Hebrew, to master Israeli culture. But that is a slippery slope. The moment you master Hebrew, your kids go to school, you deal in a Hebrew-speaking environment at work, etc. maybe one or two generations will continue stubbornly speaking Russian to their children, but slowly it begins uh, to fade. There are many Russians I have met who make fun of the way their children speak Russian, the, the grandchildren speak Russian. I have a, a, a confession to make here. We spoke English to our three children, and our three children speak English as if they were Americans. But their mother tongue, their stronger language, is Hebrew. Only one of these three decided to speak English to their children. So of my seven grandchildren, I can only speak English to two. The others, I have to speak Hebrew to. And when they come together, they speak Hebrew to each other. My children, whose English is perfect, speak Hebrew to each other. So this process is taking place among the Russians, probably more slowly, but it is taking place as well. Uh, the person who convinced me to come to Kiev in the winter um, has done some very serious research about the movement of Jews from segregation to integration. And he says, uh, Ze'ev Khanin is his name, to give him credit. Ze'ev says that the closer you get to the Russian former Soviet Union elite, the more likely you are to be in the integrationist model. Success brings you closer to the integration model. And of course, the other variables are, how young were you when you came? Did you attend school in Israel? Did you serve in the army? So that, to conclude this very little section, well, let me see what time it is. Um, most of the former Soviet Union immigrants, most, not all, some remain segregationist, but most of them have a complex, multifaceted, Jewish, Russian, Israeli uh, identity. Now, there seems to be 
an easy solution for those one-third of the Russians who come who are not Jewish. Convert what percent of the former Soviet Union non-Jewish Jews convert? Five percent. Very, very few. Why? First of all, because the rabbinate in Israel is orthodox and very strictly so. It is, in fact, often ultra-orthodox, that is, the bearded, black-hatted people that you see on TV. And for them to undergo conversion means to live a religious life. If you just convert for the sake of conversion, they will not accept it. Sometimes they'll even check to see you've converted, are you acting the way an halachic Jew needs to act. So these 95% uh, of non-Jewish Jews do something <clears throat> that is unprecedented in Jewish history. It never has happened before. Every form of Judaism, from the most orthodox to the most reform and progressive, has demanded some form of Jewish education prior to conversion, some form of religious ceremony welcoming you into the Jewish people. These Jews do neither, but they convert sociologically just by entering into Jewish life. They speak Hebrew, they serve in the army, they celebrate the Jewish holidays, Passover, Hanukkah, etc., etc., <clears throat> and hence the name non Jewish Jews because they are not Jewish according to halakha, but you would find great difficulty in distinguishing between their behavior and the behavior of secular Jews who are halakhically a Jewish. Um, sociological conversion is a very positive thing in many ways because it brings together and resolves a problem that is otherwise unresolvable, joining the Jewish people. But it also creates a serious problem, certainly in the future. A generation or two or three from now, an a child or grandchild or great-grandchild of a former Soviet Union who is a non-Jewish Jew who has sociologically converted, especially if it is the woman after whom Jewishness follows, what happens if she meets and falls in love, which inevitably will happen with a halachic Jew four generations, three generations down the pike. This is a very serious problem for the Orthodox, clearly. If the mother is not Jewish, their great-great-grandchildren will not be Jewish either, and so for the Orthodox, this is a terrible problem. In fact, among the ultra-Orthodox and some of the Orthodox, there is now talk of creating public genealogies in which you can look up how far back to look to see if the mother, in fact, was Jewish and the Jewishness continued through the generation. Um, but it's not only the Orthodox. There is a stubborn core of opinion, even among those who consider themselves traditional, 
not really religious, and even among some secular people, that they would prefer, nevertheless, that their children be Jewish in all, uh, all parameters, including the Orthodox one. It's true today, in fact, that Reform Judaism accepts patrilineal descent, that is, a Jewish father as well, and their conversion is very easy. But they are, as I will speak about in one of the coming lectures, a small, small force in Israel. It's the Orthodox that uh, dominate. This problem will not be easy to solve. And for some people, the alarmists say that this will create two classes of Jews in Israel and disunite the country and create difficulties for these great-great-grandchildren who no longer are Jewish in the halachic traditional sense, but nevertheless have sociologically converted. Let me give you an example of how bizarre this problem can be. Imagine a Jewish mother, I'm sorry, a mother who is a non-Jewish Jew, but has sociologically converted from A to Z, living next door to a secular but entirely Jewish family. Let us say, and this is quite common, that the non-Jewish Jews family is much more Jewishly observant in terms of holidays and so on than their Jewish secular neighbor next door. The one, nevertheless, is Jewish, halakhically, and the other is not. We've spoken so far about sociological, religious issues. I want to turn now for a moment to something that I mentioned just a few moments ago, politics. The movement of the Soviet Jews politically from the time that they have come. Ex-Soviet Jews have only weak loyalty to liberal democratic views. In the current terminology, they are more illiberal Democrats. So, so Democrats. The illiberal view carries certain not always positive ideas about Western democracy. It is true, well, let me start from the other side. The rule in political science is, generally, countries that have undergone a period of democratic rule, take Czechoslovakia, for example, when the opportunity to turn democratic again presents itself, the Soviet Union collapses, they turn to democracy much more easily than those who do not have any experience with democratic government. It is true that the Jews who came to Israel in 1990 and so on came after repressive communism had failed. But they had internalized 70 years or so of Soviet rule and Soviet ideas about politics, which were broadly authoritarian, uh, an understanding that politics means obedient, obedience to the more powerful, the yearning and veneration for a strong leader, 
Realpolitik, the German word for the politics of power, not soft power, hard power, and cynicism toward high political ideals and visions. Even after Soviet uh, communism fell, as many of this, this room know, or at least their parents will tell them, were five, six, seven years of chaos, ugliness, poverty, etc. So they did not get a democratic experience from that. They got chaos, which was another way of saying democracy fails. So that from this new form capitalist jungle, certain very rich people, obscenely rich people grew up and many people lost everything that they had. Research, even current research, shows that former Soviet immigrants tend to view the world in authoritarian black and white uh, categories. Friend, enemy. Rather than in the more complex, uh, sometimes painful shades of gray that are the definition in many ways of liberal, democratic, Western, humanistic government. It should not be forgotten then that Soviet Jews came from a country that had no experience with democracy at all. There were generations of Tsarist Russia, and Tsarist Russia switched quickly to Bolshevik Russia, to Communist Russia, until it collapsed. So their views of democracy in coming to Israel are let us say, skin deep. They're thin and not deep uh, in the liberal democratic sense. Their commitments are uncertain and shallow. When presented with questions about security and authority on one side, and human rights and civil rights of minorities, on the other, they are, for the most part, I'm generalizing, of course, on the first side of, their, of this equation. This is also true in regard to foreign policy. Their ideas of foreign policy are rooted in power. Power works. Vision doesn't. Soft power is a myth. Let me tell you a short story, a quick, quick story that we heard from a uh, middle school teacher who was teaching about Zionist history and how the Jews came to Israel and rebuilt and all that. And this ex-Soviet young boy got up and said, Enough with all this Leninism. They did not want to hear high ideals and visions. They did not think along those lines. Now I want, where I found numbers, I'd like to cite them. And it is, particularly in terms of politics, that the quantitative research was available to me, at least. One study reports that 78% of the Russians express a yearning for a strong regime led by a strong leader. 
which is considerably higher than other Israelis. For example, Putin is very popular among Russian immigrants. In fact, let me continue, the most visible Russian politician in Israel, Avigdor Lieberman, who I'll mention in just a moment, is spoken of often as the Israeli Putin, because his, his grossness, his uh, political power stance is very clear. Interestingly, when, okay, we'll be democratic, but what kind of democracy do we want? 72% of these ex-Soviet Olim preferred, and I quote, a technocratic professional government. That is not a government that represents political parties and political figures, etc. They wanted it to be as far away as representative government in the Western style. Um, among more than half, 51% of the ex-Soviet Union supported limiting seriously limiting the right to criticize the state. A leading um, research institute found that in terms of gender roles, men and women, Russians were considerably more conservative than Israelis. In terms of what's spoken of as homophobic, that is, hatred of homosexuals, etc., also true. Uh, I just want to get all these numbers correct in my mind here. Uh, a great majority of ex Soviet immigrants, and remember they are, may well be non-Jewish Jews. 88% uh, expressed strongly negative attitudes towards activists on the left. Now this is not left, communism left, this is left in terms of attitudes toward the settlements and toward Arabs and etc. Cetera, et cetera. Um, many, I don't have the number, were not satisfied with the Israeli regime and would prefer it to be less democratic and more authoritarian. The party of this Avigdor Lieberman that I just mentioned ago, Yisrael Beteinu, Israel, our home, their election slogan, not this one, but the previous one was, no loyalty, no vote. And they actually had loyalty oaths that they insisted that anyone who wanted to vote uh, would have to agree with. And could you imagine an Arab signing on the dotted line I agree that Israel is a Zionist Jewish state, etc., etc. The clear objective here was to either disenfranchise or at least weaken um, the, uh, the Arab vote. This party, Yisrael Beteno, which was at the beginning the Russian party, it no longer is. It's with integration, it's become loosely Russian because Avigdor Lieberman is Russian and he acts in this authoritarian way. Their policy changed over the years. At first, they encouraged what is called 
voluntary transfer, meaning they would pay the Arabs substantial sums to move and leave the country. But then the term transfer is a dirty word, ethnic transfer is a dirty word in contemporary politics. Um, even though, let me add to make it clear, nearly a third of the Russian immigrants think that Arabs should be de deprived of the right to vote. Um, uh, Victor Lieberman again and the policy. At f first it began as this voluntary transfer. But then it changed. And it became a much more subtle policy. It was called, or I should call it, redrawing the borders. There are two main areas in Israel in which Arab villages exist. And they are on the border, the Green Line border, the border between pre-1967 and post-1967 Israel. One of them is called Vadi Ara, which is in the mid-north of the country. And the other one is called the Small Triangle which is right near where we live, includes cities like Taiba, Tira, which are also Arab. But all of them are on the border, where the ceasefire lines actually were drawn. What Yisrael Betenu suggested is that the border be redrawn. It be redrawn to exclude as many Arabs as possible, without them moving, they'll stay in their houses, and include all the or mainly main Jewish settlements in the West Bank, and then again in the small triangle again. So here you have a proposition that is not transferring anybody physically, but nevertheless is moving Arabs who do not want to go against their will to the Palestinian state if and when it uh, arises. Um, this policy has virtually no chance of being accepted. It is opposed by the Israeli government, it is opposed by Israeli Arabs. It is opposed by the Palestinian state. It is opposed by the um, uh, international community. Lieberman's party is called, again, in the language of political scientists, populist or nativist, most accurate is exclusionary populist. In other words, those who don't really belong to us, read Arabs, are not really part of our country. Somehow, they are an alien body, a foreign body that needs to be um, uh, treated as such. Interestingly, though, and here, once again, this crazy uh, complexity uh, is visible. Lieberman is not religious at all. He is representing a constituency, in fact, that is secular. The Russian uh, Jews who came are secular Jews, and many of them are non-Jewish Jews. But I think that Lieberman doesn't care about such halakhic distinctions. For him, for him, there are the Israeli patriots and those who are not. And whether you have a Jewish mother or whatever is of very little interest to him. Um, the Israeli 
paradox then, going back to the core of what I've been saying, is that the Soviet immigrants have moved and are moving slowly from a segregationist to an integrationist model. It is, as I say, very slow. It is happening, well, let me tell you, we were invited to a, uh, a birthday party of a Russian friend who's turning 60, I believe, and they made a party. It was a long table. There were place names where everyone was to sit. All the place names were in Russian, and ours was in Hebrew. <laughs> So you get a sense that it still is there, but it is moving. I want to say one last thing in uh, conclusion. Israel, in the last two decades or so, has taken a very sharp turn to the right. Uh, the government that Israel has today is by far the most right-wing government that Israel has ever had. It is a coalition between the right nationalists, including Israel Beteno of the Vigdor Lieberman, and the religious. The politics is moving to the right. So the Soviet, ex-Soviet right-wingers who found themselves on the margins during the period, say, of Rabin and the Oslo process, now have moved far closer to the comfortable center. OK, thank you very much. Uh, any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Um, what I did here was to take a chapter of a book that I had written, cross out all the sources, because it's not important what the name is, but I think either I brought it along or I can send it to you. One of the main sources, one of the most powerful and respected, is the Israel Democracy Institute that takes monthly uh, polls that they call the Democracy Index, and they do it in all parts of the country. Of all of them, I think that's the main one. There is other, Leshem, Tokatli, I could mention names that I recall, um, but that if you want, I can show you the original page, paper with all the pages and the citations. If anyone else has a question, I'll deal with it as quickly as I can. Okay, yes. I have uh, question about um, the segregation of uh, Russian uh, uh, area and why, what is the reason of these uh, difficulties and uh, maybe because they were the, the, the last, uh, not the last area, but uh, in... Okay, uh, so very quickly. There are a number of reasons why the Soviet Aliyah has been different than many others. First, they came a million strong. It was not the trickle from uh, Western Europe and Eastern Europe. So they formed some form of critical mass, and therefore their culture preserved, and they stayed together. Um, the ability to function in Israel by listening to Russian digital broadcasts kept Russians segregated as well. Um, the sense that Russian culture was somehow superior kept them together as well. As I said, kept them in the past. But I think that the fair projection for the future is that it slowly will change, is slowly changing.